um, because we're going to show you an image that has buildings in their parking lot, but that's part of the expo exploration. Um, this is a, and we're going to we're going to evolve this list of um, kind of the compilation of what the big ideas from our session on Saturday was, and um, the idea is that that nine out of ten things, well, the things that got talked about by um, more than one person and a few things that got maybe talked about by one person would be represented here. Uh, so, but we don't wanna have too many bullets. We don't wanna represent every variation on it. So some of these are categories that a lot of things fit in, but um, I think we can put this on the MyTaft Corners website. So we, we're, we're discussing this and there'll be a little bit more shifting and, and uh, fine tuning on this as we go. But these are the, uh, one version of the things we heard from you on Saturday, uh, changing from auto-centric to people-centric or from a place, a place that's all about cars to a place that's all about people, sometimes in cars, but more often on foot and on bicycles. Um, mixed use, writ large, a lot of different things happening. Um, and um, housing, mixed, diverse, and affordable. Green spaces, preserve and enhance. <clears throat> access to, it's a, a lot of categories there, like um, like being able to see the beauty of uh, Allenbrook, uh, as well as protect it and other areas that can be enlarged upon, um, and uh, public space of the kinds of parks, but also uh, squares and greens and great streets, um, streets to sit at a cafe and drink coffee. Um, <clears throat> And uh, there's some, uh, another category where people talked about things to do better, uh, reutilize uh, some of those existing big box buildings at some point, make it easy for those to have different uses and uh, try and absorb, reutilize the parking lots as well as um, absorb some of that parking. And all of these ideas uh, lead to, lead to uh, six others or six subcategories, but, I'm going to show you a few things on the plan that we've been working on. <clears throat> Start with the aerial. I'm going to shift to uh, our uh, our plan that shows the trees, the wetlands, um, streets and buildings, but it kind of emphasizes the natural component here. Um, and we have been having uh, have been uh, conversations about how to build on some of the things existing. And I apologize, I don't have a strong uh, a strong cursor here, but um, I hope you can, some of you can see, um, can you see my uh, my pointer going around the, the Burr Oak Forest at the, the hill? Yes. By the water tank, okay. That's uh, absolutely, this area needs to be preserved and taken advantage of. Just actually, you see a little drawing of that. We've been exploring the wetlands, flipping over to the far Eastern side, maybe expanding some greenery around these wetlands and wetlands buffers that could help with water filtration and also possibly uh, parks that people can use. Um, and a great agreement also on having a park down in the loop, which is also a wetland and a, and a stream flow uh, at the, the loop of Harvest Lane. Um, and now let me go forward one more. Here's a close up on that. Uh, one thing I want to talk about, and I'm flipping to a bit of another subject, and that's the idea of um, that we sort of build up a main street. It's a little bit what the, the buildings facing 2A tried to do, but find a place where we can have a pedestrian friendly main street, uh, buildings on two sides of the street with storefronts. Uh, that's a comfortable place to walk and sit. One of the ideas that actually came up, uh, I definitely credit the citizens with this, came up during our Saturday session, is having that along, along too, partly in front of the Healthy Living Store. Uh, second one, perhaps Marshall Avenue, down where people, uh, part of the idea behind that is there's a fair amount of traffic there, which is good for retail, uh, from people coming off to, to head to the east. <coughs> and 
yet another idea, uh, and that is a bit of Trader Lane, which is Trader Lane's being very seriously discussed, being built and extending all the way up to two. Um, and I want to stress in, in all of these cases, we're talking about not a really long street, actually on purpose, a short street, a block or a couple of blocks where there'd be a real effort to make those uh, active storefronts. And another idea was, right, the extension of Connor Way, uh, that has, would have the advantage of being having new buildings possibly built on both sides, um, not having to deal with existing buildings for the most part, and also uh, the fact that Wright Connor, uh, changing names right at 2A, is a straight connection over to the green at Maple Tree Place, which is a retail green. So there's a connection there that there is some kind of synergy in starting to knit the two halves together. Um, all of these are up in the air. There's so many factors that, uh, that affect which one might be the best choice. And um, uh, we're exploring all those, a lot of different actors, including certainly the property owners. Um, things that make sense there. Now I wanna shift over to Maple Tree Place. And this is where I'm gonna show you some uh, early explorations. These have not even been shown to the property owners, but it's an example of, of what we're thinking about and what our early explorations are. This is a look at sort of the street pattern there. Now it does include things like there's some couple of pedestrian streets, I'll call them in, in uh, Maple Tree Place. We consider those part of a connected network. <coughs> And here I'm going to do an overlay is an idea of how uh, potentially this is exploring potential places where new buildings could be built. Uh, this is a pretty dramatic change. Uh, you know, the light brown buildings are uh, possible new building footprints. They're all over the place. Um, I will point out uh, buildings up in front of Shaw, pretty clearly understood. You don't you just don't uh, put buildings in front of the Shaw's parking lot. They might not like that. Uh, that's a much longer term thing. That might be where you're talking about the 50 year uh, aspect of this plan. So I'll put a little, a little cover over that uh, so we can talk about some of the other areas. And it's things like uh, utilizing the friendlies property more. Um, also an idea here, the power lines as you all know, there's some high tension power lines running down um, the back just on the, the western side of Maple Tree Place, which are, uh, that's a hard thing to deal with. In a perfect world, they would just go away and the power would be underground or something like that. But that's, um, that's a very big deal. Way, it's a big deal to bury any kind of power lines, but the high tension ones are, are off the charts. So, um, this is an idea about trying to live with that and turning it, turning it into more of a positive. The land underneath those power lines can be, um, you can park there and things can be green there as long as they're not tall. Um, so there's one aspect is uh, th that land under there can be more carefully tended. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, we've worked in a couple of places where communities had community gardens under those under those power lines. Um, and um, I know uh, my knee jerks a little bit thinking there might be something wrong with that. Uh, to my knowledge, there isn't, but that's a, that's a choice. But some of these could be used as community gardens. That's part of the idea. And then the buildings here, we're showing small buildings infilled um, on the back edge of some of the Maple Tree Place parking lots. That's an idea. Uh, one point we talked about those is row houses sort of matching the ones on the uh, eastern side of Maple Tree Place, but they might more likely be kind of incubator spaces or uh, arts spaces, very simple buildings um, that have, uh, you know, a decent front door and windows, but inside or a shell that could be used uh, by uh, anyone to do almost anything, start up a business, uh, have an art um, uh, have an art studio, make things at a very small scale. So there's a, there's a little window into our minds when we're exploring. 
this is part of that first step that then we start to test against a lot of things. So this will, you know, you'll see a lot of change here. Also notice at the bottom right corner, an idea about being uh, something careful and really trying to make something uh, special, adding on to what's already special about the hillock, I'll call it here. This is the current water tower. And just an idea about having some trails, some walkways through there, and perhaps a view tower up at the high point, um, a viewpoint from which you should have an incredible view in about 360 degrees um, of, of the whole county and the mountain range beyond. Now, uh, moving back, Talk a little bit about a possibility for Trader Lane, which is an extension like this. Now we've given it a kind of a particular shape, but basically uh, it, it would extend, it would extend from Marshall on the south up to Williston Road and approximately make a full intersection with Helena Drive up here. Um, and an idea that that uh, we're really uh, keen on is that instead of simply coming straight through or flowing through, we put a green in there. This is a, a civic green, kind of a park, um, tree-lined, and in a way, this screen in, in the middle of the uh, eastern, western side, pardon me, has sort of a partner over here in Maple Tree Place. The character, we're not suggesting this is a retail green like Maple Tree Place, but this would be probably a residential green. I don't think you'd stop anyone from putting a, a corner store or a coffee shop there, but this would be a residential green that's a gathering space, recreational space for everyone on this side and frankly, everyone who could uh, who would come over here. It's about 400 feet long and the actual green part in between the streets would be about 130 feet wide. Um, and we have some more ideas about that. Um, and let me show you a couple of things. Uh, talk about Trader Lane and more generally, uh, the idea of cycle tracks, which are bicycle lanes that are not in the street, but actually a step out of it and more protected. Uh, Rick Chelman, who is, I think Rick's on this call, um, put this together. And I believe this is a, might be a familiar shape in the mountain range. Um, the idea, here's the cycle track up on the curb. So it's away from the on-street parking. And between the cycle track, the bicycles, which might be moving at a fair speed, and the pedestrians, you have the tree lawn. So the bicycles are protected from the cars. The cars are, uh, by, sorry. The pedestrians are protected from the bicycles and the bicycles are protected from the cars, all of whom are moving at different speeds. So for someone who's really commuting or going someplace, this is uh, the way to go. Now, many of these streets in our mind will be very slow streets with frequent stops. So a bicycle bicyclist would be perfectly comfortable right in the lane. But on some streets, there's a real logic, you need that, that bicycle lane. So this is a thought, this could be the section for Trader Lane, um, or it could be a section for um, a modification of um, Harvest. My mind just went blank on the full name of that, I apologize. Um, so here, that's kind of an idea of our thinking about, um, about bicycles. And I wanna jump now, here's, so we're still talking about uh, Trader Lane. This is two on top and then 2A coming down the side. So this is showing, I think here's Harvest Lane. Um, here's Trader Lane, a, a, a suggestive alignment from us. And again, here's a, that green. So traffic would come and instead of coming straight through, uh, part of the cut through traffic would be calmed. Um, traffic would go in uh, one way right like this and coming down, I didn't mean to do that, so I got ahead of myself. And then coming down from the north heading south would be this pattern. So traffic flows, but um, it's, not, uh, it's not a fast route. And then you have this green tree line, very pleasant. 
And this is an early exploration of buildings that could be built, new buildings along that trader lane. Um, these could be residential, they could be a mix, but they're certainly amenable to both. And uh, looking at the parking, these aren't necessarily parking structures because of the topography, about 30 foot drop from here to here. Um, those could be parking decks that there's no ramp, but you come in from Trader Lane and you're on the upper, you come in from um, Harvest or one of the cross streets and you're on the lower. It's a, it's a large increment, less expensive than, uh, than a real parking structure with, uh, with ramps on it. But also these could be built, um, this is, we're still doing the math, uh, crunching the numbers, but uh, likely these blocks could have uh, three-story buildings uh, on them, uh, parking in the basement of the building and on the surface within the lot, within the block. And um, thoughts about, and actually we'd like you all to talk to us about this. Here's some thoughts about what that street frontage along Trader Lane might look like and possibly buildings although uh, and we're not asking you to commit to, some of these are bigger than others, but more the, uh, the general feel is a very different, you know, narrower, uh, this has a little bit wider, call that a door yard in the front of the building. This, that is shrunken quite a bit, but still green, on-street parking, street trees. And here's another example, uh, except for that, the, the the street just before this, these these two uh, were pretty well um, pretty well liked in our consumer consumer preference survey. Sorry, I've been working uh, too many hours straight. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, stop, and uh, we can go to questions discussion. I think I'm, uh, I'm flexible, but we might leave the, the slides up in case somebody wants to refer to something specific. Thanks, person, Jeff. If you have a question, uh, you could press the raise hand button on the reaction section of your toolbar or type in the chat. Looks like Donna has a question. Donna, I'm going to ask you to unmute if you want to speak. Hey, Donna. Yeah, hi. Sorry about that. I'm just trying. Hold on. Um, so just a couple comments. Um, so you showed us this building that you just said that was desirable. Um, and it looks lovely. Um, I'm personally... I personally wouldn't like to see anything more than two stories. I'm not, I, I just think the taller buildings take away. But I'm just wondering, a building like that, you know, I was, I kind of wander through Finney Crossing, right? And I look at these buildings and they're not attractive at all. But then I, I think, you know, other buildings that I've seen in other areas, they seem a lot similar. And I'm thinking, well, you know, cost, right? You know, everything is, you know, money. So if they can build a building that's functional, but maybe doesn't look that great, but it's cheap, that's what builders do nowadays. So this building that you just showed us looks lovely, but is a builder really going to invest in, in money in building something that looks like that when they can build something that's really not attractive, but it's functional? That's my first question. Then I have another question. Can I try that one first? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. And, and I don't have this, you know, it's not a slam dunk answer, but I, it's pretty good. Part of the, uh, the form-based code would include an architectural code, a set of architectural standards. Um, and while I will be among the first to say you can't legislate beauty, uh, you, I think you can legislate decent looking buildings um, and uh, so we would talk about materials that were appropriate. So from the, the facades of buildings would only have certain materials that were of a decent quality. Um, we can talk about window proportions and we can avoid blank 
blank walls. Um, so there, there's some things that we can put them in the, give them the, the basic parameters to be a decent building. The other thing I'd say is in all of these images, um, one thing that is, is consistent is that, uh, I'll, I'll say, I, I really kind of think the most important quality is not actually what's the building like, although it's important, but the most important thing is uh, what's happening in front of the building. The, you know, the, the green, the street trees, um, the, the, the dooryard. So we're building that public space and the building face, sorry, I'm using building too many different ways. We're creating the public space, which is the street and the street trees and the sidewalk. And the face of the building is like the, the wall at each end of it, each side of it. So the building is one part of it. And I do believe we can keep it from being ugly. Well, I'll, I'll agree that, you know, the trees and the shrubs add to it. But I mean, if you took this picture that I'm seeing in the second row on the right, and you take out all those trees and bushes and everything, and then you put that next to one of the buildings in Finney Crossing. I think there's a, <laughs> I mean, it's night and day. Let's face it. Come on. <laughs> so, I will not, I'm not going to argue with you. Okay. Thank you. That one. Thank you. Now, and then my other question was, um, I know that um, it's kind of a, a big idea that uh, we build buildings in the parking lots. Um, and I have to tell you, um, it, if I, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a building on, on Route 2 going into Burlington where the post office is on the back side of it. They're building a hotel in a parking lot. And I, I, you know, when I heard about this hotel going in, me and my husband are saying, where is it going? There's no land there. They built and this hotel is kind of stalled. Like, I don't know if they've run out of money or what, but it's the ugliest thing I have ever seen. It's got a, a it's got an underground parking that looks crazy, and I it it's just the most horrendous, horrendous thing. It just doesn't fit. This look, look like there's any room for it. And if that's kind of what you're kind of throwing in as ideas in these other parking lots, I would be so against it. I think it's the most horrendous thing. I can't, you know, can't wait for it to be done. It's probably going to be lovely, I'm sure. But um, if that's kind of what you're promoting, I would be so against it because it just looks totally ridiculous. Oh, well, I have to, I have to say, since I haven't seen it, absolutely not. Um, uh, you you go get a picture of it. Well, I'm wondering. Uh, it's incredible. Yeah, I'm wondering if Paul uh, if Paul has seen it because he's uh, he's up uh, he's up yeah. in Newport and he comes down. Yeah, it'd be a interesting lot. to get your take on that because I I just can't believe that that got approved, and it just seems I'm I don't know that much about it, but I'm assuming it's going to be a third three story kind of thing, and it just looks so well, out of place. I, again, I don't I don't well, know because it hasn't gone, it, all they've done is the underground parking, but if that's any indication of what it's going to be, it's horrendous. Oh, well. And those I, are my, just my two comments. Thank you very okay. much. Well, I hope you keep your fingers crossed. Uh, one thing, if if they do it, any kind of a competent job, when they're done, you should have no clue that it used to be a parking lot. Um, mm. I mean, you should just see. Like, Want to make a hundred dollar bet on that? Uh, no, ma'am. <laughs> No, ma'am. <laughs> it would be nice if that's what it comes out to be. Yes. Uh, yeah. And one thing I, I do know, we show these images that have uh, fairly big trees. Uh, and, you know, that just means somebody had the wisdom to plant them a few years ago. Now, the, the picture in the middle, which is maybe not as beautiful as the ones on the other side of it, uh, those trees aren't actually that old. Uh, those might be 10 years old. Uh, but they were planted where they, there's actually plenty of soil, not just the little green square. That's a, that's a structural soil, and there's the trees' roots really can go happily under the sidewalk. But uh, trees do, you can't plant them that big, but it takes a little time. But I've done projects where um, um, I 
would visit them in the first couple of years, I felt like, man, I wish the trees were bigger. And then I came back at, at year five and like, boom. Um, so it takes, it's not instant, but, uh, but they can have a big impact in a fairly short amount of time. But thank you, Donna. Thank you. Well, thanks, Donna. It looks like Terry is up next with a question. Terry, please unmute yourself. Hi, yes, so uh, my name is Terry Marin. And so I was at Saturday's um, event. And so I just wanted to ask, but I've heard a lot about uh, traffic calming and pedestrian safety and safety of bicyclists um, and whatnot, but there hasn't been a lot of talk about traffic the actual traffic, the cars, the big trucks that are here in Williston. And I'm just wondering, the plan is that if you're gonna build more buildings, more people, what is gonna happen with the traffic? And as I see it, there's not a whole lot of places to expand on Route 2 or 2A. It's pretty well built. There's no expansion that I can see. Um, and it just, you know, I know it's it's limited to certain times of the day, certain times of the year that the traffic is so bad, but there are, you know, uh, there's reasons why I avoid Taps Corners. I will either go to Richmond or Hinesburg, or I will take the back way, you know, Creamery Road to get onto the interstate to, to go somewhere else. Um, so it just seems that nobody's really talking about, you know, what what's going to happen with all this traffic? Because I see there's a lot of, you know, seems anxiety with when people are backed up. There's people running red lights. There's, you know, the lights don't stay green long enough. People, you know, are just more aggressive. Um, so I don't know what the thought is about that. I, and it would have been great to have somebody on the mobility group to have. Um, you know, been able to speak to that and talk about what's in the plans. So that was well, one of my, I have one more, but that's one question. That's a, that's a good one and a big one. Um, I would say, fortunately, we have uh, Rick Chelman, who's on our team, is in the, is, uh, I see his name in the box right next to mine. And he is a, he is a traffic uh, engineer and, and urbanist um, that uh, we've been working together for about three decades, or at least two, That's which is long enough. But uh, we are not ignoring that. And I'm hoping I can get Rick to unmute that he hasn't gone to the refrigerator uh, right when you were at, oh, here he is. Uh, Rick, do you want to? We're very well aware of this. There are a whole bunch of issues at Taft Corners that relate to traffic. And one of the problems today, the land use pattern and the transportation pattern tend to create extreme peaks of traffic at certain times of day. And by expanding the street network to create additional options, but also adding a mix of uses will balance things out and internalize some of the trips. Jeff touched on the idea of trying to focus on moving people as well as moving cars. And, you know, Taft Corners has a regional traffic component that is going to continue for, for some time. And all the available data that we have, which isn't a lot, but it is a fair amount because the, uh, the exit study, for example, we have, um, it's all manageable. And I think there are traffic management solutions, signal timing, that sort of a thing that uh, need to be looked at. But also we, we're very well aware of uh, trying to balance all modes of transport going as, as we add things to this plan. So good question. No answers yet, but we're looking at it. And, and so I would add I to that. Also, oh, go ahead. Well, go ahead. No, go oh, ahead. Would, well, and I'm, uh, uh, Rick can correct me if I'm getting uh, too off base here, but part of what we're going to be doing is, uh, you know, there are some streets will carry more traffic than others, and we'll try and uh, make those still pleasant places to walk along. But uh, a lot of the environment we're talking about within the Taft Corners 
will be areas where um, there may be uh, a lot of traffic going on, but it's still uh, very comfortable to walk even during peak hours. You're comfortable walking on those streets inside Taft Corners. And when you have to cross the street, uh, you're only crossing uh, you know, small distances. We're talking about uh, bump outs. And also uh, most of the streets in Taft Corners will not be, built. they can carry traffic and help disperse traffic, but they won't really be cut throughs of any speed. So it's gonna be a better, uh, a better environment when you're on, on foot and on bicycle. And speed speed is a very important part of that. There's a, this is counterintuitive, but it's true that you actually don't change the capacity of a street by increasing the speed of the vehicles on it. All you do is make it less safe. So that's another thing we're looking at. So I know there was some discussion in a meeting I was at, how a lot of the traffic that comes through Williston is going to other town, you know, it's going to Essex or Underhill, Jericho, and people are just passing through. Um, you know, I wonder if there is a way to incentivize um, commuting, you know, on a bus and whether that can, you know, is that being looked at? Um, I know myself, I used to, years and years ago, um, bus and a, or a van, and it added two to three hours to my day. Um, of my work day. So that was, that was a, t that was tough. You know, that was a commitment to do. Um, and I don't know if there's any way to kind of sweeten, you know, some way to get folks to consider commuting on a bus um, to get to Burlington or I know they already go to Montpelier, but well, one way, one way to incentivize it is to create nodes of, uh, enough intensity that people are actually walking to transit as much as possible. You know, stop and rides don't really work that well in this type of environment. Um, so, you know, there's a, there is a location for a transit center already dedicated on the plan that the town owns. It's small, uh, but as this area develops, it might be much more viable and transit itself will be more viable. You have to, at lower densities and with a disparity of uses like this, you really have to subsidize transit a great deal to get it to be utilized, which is the sweet in the pot thing you were mentioning, Terry. So, um, you know, it's, again, these are not simple questions and we're, we are aware of them. Okay, yeah, I was you know, thinking maybe movie tickets or pizzas or, you know, something to, you know, I like that. coupons to go to shopping <laughs> to really make it worth people out. And just another comment I had was um, to do with the Allenbrook. And I'm glad that you um, mentioned about preserving it because I did mention in the little breakout group um, that I was in on Saturday that, you know, to have a, a walking trail all along the Allenbrook would really um, not be good for walking as that's like a wildlife corridor. So I think it's important to remember that this area is um, hard enough for wildlife to navigate and to take that away from them and put people and dogs and tra trails and things like that on, on that would, um, would really, I think, hurt the wildlife. And I can, I can say, uh, I heard you loud and clear. And so we'll, yeah, we're, we're not going to be doing that. We might be doing, I mean, we want to do a little bit of increased access so people can get a glimpse, but, but your point is really definitely heard. And, and I think even when we went back to the, the, the main group, there were other people typing in the chat about, yes. about observing it. So, okay, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. I see a hand. Hi, uh, I think you see mine. This is Tim Carney. I just wanted to support Terry's um, concerns about the uh, uh, wildlife quarter along Allen Brook. <clears throat> We're up up in another area, and it's it's a very active wildlife area. There's there's beaver, there are there are uh, mink, 
and owls and a ton of birds. Deer. Deer go through there all the time. And I, I, I share Terry's concern. If, if it becomes highly accessible, it will disrupt all that wildlife. And I, I think it's a, it would be an unfortunate loss. So thanks for letting me say that. <clears throat> I'd say thanks for saying that. That, that uh, I don't know, this might be uh, a little bit of, a, I'm not trying to be funny here, but it, what, you, what you both said makes me really want to see it. It sounds uh, just incredible. You're, uh, you're welcome to, I'll put my, my information in the uh, um, chat for you. And if you want to give me a call, I'd be glad to walk over to you anytime. Okay, might not be right away. I get my second shot next week. Okay. Uh, could I, I might read something uh, in, in the chat. Uh, read Willis to everyone. You had uh, termed the Trader Lane Green area as residential, which is a way we're thinking, not a, not a final determination. But uh, he goes on, are you thinking that residences, apartments, townhouse homes might be built in that Southwest quadrant? If so, I'd be concerned that it becomes an isolated island where those residents don't really uh, have a connectedness or neighborhood. Um, and and uh, yes, yeah, I would say we get that. And, and that's not something we would wanna do or have them be isolated. Uh, but on the other hand, what uh, the direction this is going with the connected grid is uh, they would only be isolated if someone built that and then the rest of it wasn't built. It's really all, Part of a larger system where they would be uh, connected, and, uh, I, and I will say we heard a lot of call for um, housing of various types uh, and income levels in this area. So um, it it might be that uh, eventually there's a lot of housing uh, in, in that area, but we're sensitive to the uh, not creating a, an isolated little node. That's um, unpleasant and almost the same as, well, in some ways, socially the same as putting somebody at, a, at the end of a cul-de-sac out in the middle of nowhere. Um, we're, we're very much about uh, things being interconnected and, and walkable. And I will say every time it comes up, the uh, mention about protecting the wildlife corridors generates a number of comments in the in the chat. Uh, any other any other raised hands or um, chat in chat box. So I, I just have one thought while we're still chatting. Is it all right if I Oh yes. Great. So, so there was conversation about the um, having green spaces and things in parks all around the town. Um, but it so I'm just wondering how easy that will be to implement. Just taking Finney Crossing as an example, where they were supposed to have this nice green for a you know, area for people to, you know, sit and relax and whatnot. And as the project developed, that just disappeared and it became this little postage stamp. Mm. Um, so, you know, how, how can this form-based code um, make sure that these developments are held to some sort of standard? I mean, um, one way is uh, is a form-based code works a little different than, than normal zoning in that it's very place-based and there's a um, there's a uh, it's a I, I call it but I write form-based code so I'm biased but I call it a 21st century zoning map and that's uh, uh, we call it a regulating plan which uh, which actually lays out the uh, approximate locations of streets and blocks and for instance, the green I was talking about would be uh, would be mapped 
and would be zoned uh, in a way as that being a, a green, a public open space. Um, so it's uh, it's actually it's it's in the plan. It's not uh, a reference, a vague reference uh, somewhere that uh, is is amb ambiguous as to its physical size and location. It's pretty pretty precise. Um, and also, when we do these things, you know, we have to think about um, the amount of land being taken, and does that balance out with the increase in in property value? Uh, generally, those things uh, balance out because in a form-based code, you're going to a more urban, and by the way, urban for me is a good word. It doesn't mean parking lots and, and the bad stuff. That's, that's kind of dysfunctional, problematic urbanity. Um, it's the good stuff about people and mixes and um, good open space. But um, generally, uh, when you're going from a suburban to a more urban situation, the land gets used more inten intensely. So there's an, there's an increase in value. And in effect, uh, the town is, is creating a situation where all the land is more valuable. So um, taking some parks out here and there is something that, um, that, makes, that makes sense uh, besides for the town, also for the, the property owners because the rest of their property is more valuable. You can't take a huge park though. Uh, there are limits to that. Town have to be purchasing this land from a developer. Uh, if uh, if the land gets big, uh, in our work, uh, most of the times we've done small civic greens and squares. They're small enough that the offset for the the buildings around it, uh, the land around it, is it just gets accepted. Uh, there was one case um, where we had a a neighborhood park that was big enough. Uh, and this was in very close to a, a, a large metropolitan area. And it actually had a kind of an ugly, but a, a shopping center on it. Uh, and that that involved a negotiation and something to do with their local um, tax increment financing system or some tax break. So there was there was a negotiation on that property, but for the most part, the the, the land is being increased enough in value and made more developable. So that uh, it's an absorbed, uh, it's an absorbed cost. It's it's really more than compensated for. And thank you for asking questions about uh, form-based codes because that's my specialty. And I, uh, I there aren't many people who are interested in getting down in the weeds uh, with that stuff, which is I, I will say is a long ways off. We have to get the the vision before we. Uh, write the rules for it, but and Jeff, I'm I'm going to comment. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, having been living in Vermont and having administered two form-based codes, one in Newport and one in Winooski, it's entirely enforceable. That's the beauty of of the. So it's not it's not a option. I you might do this or might not do it. It's something that becomes part of the the permit process. So. We can enforce, as a zoning administrators, you can enforce the rules of the regu regulating map or the regulating plan and the code itself. And, and Vermont state statute enables that capacity within the zoning administrators um, realm. Well, so I'm um, only seeing one comment in the chat, um, a preference for slide 26 that's shown on the screen, but I'm not seeing any other questions or raised hands from folks. I'm a fan of slide 26 too. <laughs> I don't uh, get to go there very often, but it's a... Uh, uh, um, I just wanted to, well, before we all take off, remind folks that um, this is the first of a series of these short check-in meetings, and we'll be coming back same time, same place tomorrow night. Um, so keep in touch with us and, and watch as the project 
evolves. Um, the other thing is the discussion about the green and the enforceability of the regulating plan. And I'll just put in a plug for the project our mobility group's been working on, which is to bring an adoptable official map uh, to Williston as well, which is also a type of map of planned public facilities that gives the town regulatory authority to require um, streets and paths, but also public facilities like parks. Uh, and that map could ultimately be amended to reflect what's in that regulating plan that's part of the form-based code. And under statute, it does add some additional authority for the town to plan out, draw out, and require those spaces to be incorporated into new development or require um, applicants for new development to offer those lands to the town for sale. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big tool. Emily's screen sharing the draft official map right now. Um, on my tiny screen, it's a little hard to see, but there's some red and blue along the streets reflecting existing and desired sidewalks, paths, street connections, et cetera. Um, this map was developed based on what's on the ground now, and to some extent, some knowledge that we would be expanding greatly on the original grid street plan for Taft Corners. Um, and that we would we would get this map in and adopted, but we would probably be coming back to do things um, like adding more street connections and planned grids, uh, green spaces once the form based code was um, firmed up and in place. So this is another tool uh, that can work in concert with what we're doing about Taft Corners. Um, to make sure those spaces end up in places that the town was counting on and that they are. Um, I guess I'd say a lot harder to adjust than the process that uh, Finney Crossing went through when it adjusted the size and placement of its originally, you know, sort of large central green. And that's all I had to add for tonight. Um, I'd open it up if there's any more final questions or comments. Oh, great. Um, we did record this meeting, um, so we'll, we'll continue to publish recordings of the meetings uh, through the mytafcorners.com website. That's where we're keeping all of the information about this project available. And please join us in the next couple nights to watch the project evolve and definitely, definitely schedule in Monday evening, May 3rd um, for the big reveal um, of that first draft vision plan. Thank you, Jeff and, and consultant team and CCRPC staff. And again, thank you very much, uh, Williston staff and citizens for coming out tonight and being a part of this once in a generation opportunity to shape the future of Taft Corners. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.